from the presentation and the discussion that will take place today. Before we move forward, I would like to let everyone know that we are live, and since you are in the room, you get us the authorization to have uh, your image on the ESF website. Um, I would like also to thank um, everyone that are watching us online and from the ESF broadcast system and especially those from the cable program. And we have students from 19 other universities that are watching us right now. And thank you to them. And thank you to the other viewers from the YouTube channel of Sony ESF. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Obste Asme. I'm currently a PhD student here at ESF um, in the Department of Forest Management. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the State University of Haiti, and I moved in 2013 to Syracuse University to like the Asian Initiative Program at SU, where I get my um, Master of Science in Chemical Engineering. Um, this program was led by Professor Paula Johnson, Linda Carty, and John Asin, and I'm always grateful to them. Also, um, this year, I am the Cable Student Delegate. Um, as you know, Cable is the Advanced Bioeconomic Leadership Education Program. It's a USDA-funded program that includes 20 academic institutions in the US. And the project goal is to create a network of institutions <coughs> that will leverage public and private relationship and resource to enhance bioeconomic workforce development effort across the United States. So before um, we go to the presentation, um, I would like to invite you to turn off your cell phone or put them on silent mode so we do not disturb anyone. And um, we'll go over the presentation one after another. And if you have questions, you have a sheet in front of your desk, you can, you can write the question, and at the end, we have about 30 minutes to um, go over questions. So our first presentation will be made by Tim Vo, as you all know. Tim, is, Tim has over 25 years of experience working in the field of, bio, of forestry, agroforestry, short rotation woody crops, bioenergy, and phytoremediation in the United States and West Africa. He is also actively involved in the development of a harvesting system for wood crops and sustainability assessment of willow and assist companies and government agencies determine the availability of woody biomass from forest and short rotation woody crops. Please welcome Tim Vo. Okay, thank you, oops. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm gonna do a brief <clears throat> overview of the bioeconomy and then talk a little bit about supply just to give some context of uh, how these things work. So one way that I like to think about the bioeconomy is it's sort of a back to the future experience, right? So if we go back to the 1800s and before the 1800s, you know, North America was a plant-based economy and society, right? So the vast majority of things that were used uh, for food, fiber, building materials, transportation were all plant-based, right? So there was a study done uh, in the early 1800s, for example, every, for every two tons of plant material that were used in different parts uh, of society, we only used one ton of minerals, right? That has changed dramatically in the last 100, 150 years, uh, but that's the way it was then. Another example relative for us here in terms of forestry, right, there was a large chemical wood industry in uh, southern New York and northern Pennsylvania. At one point, there were over 170 of these chemical wood facilities operating, right, producing chemicals made from wood, things that we now make from petroleum. There's been this transition then to a fossil fuel economy. So you can see here, this is the percentage. This is just energy, but it sort of represents the overall economy, I think. 
as a percentage, starting back in the late 1700s up until even after the Civil War, the majority of the energy in the United States came from wood. It was a biomass-based system, right? That's changed rapidly as we've brought fossil fuels on into the system. <clears throat> and now we're back out here thinking about um, other transitions. We're sort of back out here thinking about how do we move back away from fossil fuels and back to more plant-based, biomass-based systems, okay? So here's a snapshot, again, of energy uh, and where we get renewable energy from in the United States uh, in trillion BTUs or two, two to six quads. And you can see from 1950 through to the present, right? So wood has always been important. Here's the energy crisis of the early 1970s, for those of us who remember that phase, right? And this uptick in using wood largely uh, as a heating source, right, because of fuel oil prices that uh, became more expensive. And then that's flowed along here, and here this is the uptick in, in uh, biofuels, so ethanol, and Richard's going to talk to us uh, about that in terms of a local example of that occurring. So biomass now is making up almost 50% of all the renewable energy used in the United States, still an important source, and now there's this whole idea of the bioeconomy and growing that further. So what is the bioeconomy? So the bioeconomy is separate from our traditional, or in addition to our traditional agriculture and forestry systems, right? It's taking new ideas and new knowledge uh, and transforming those forms of biomass or moving them through some sort of conversion, new and novel conversion processes to make a whole array of fuels, uh, bioproducts, energy materials, okay? So this is going to be great because we have lots of, right? Jesse works at the lab scale. Tom has worked at the lab scale and is now doing a startup. Richard runs a large-scale operation here in central New York, and Jackie has spent quite a bit of time in the last few years looking at the potential and all the opportunities here in central New York at different scales. So we're going to get sort of this pathway, uh, comments along this pathway. You've got to move things from new ideas uh, that may start at a university or in a, in a lab at a, in industry and move them all the way through to commercialization. There's lots of challenges associated with that. But that's the idea of the bioeconomy, using biomass resources and new knowledge to make new products uh, and put them into the economy. It's not just a U.S. thing. So this is a snapshot of countries that have policies around the world. And the dark green is where they have intentional policies. The light green is where they have bioeconomy uh, initiatives built into other policies. So it's happening in lots and lots of places around the world. So what are bioproducts? Uh, that's the first thing. So the USDA has this certification process. There have been over 200 2,500 products have been certified as bioproducts here in the U.S. And I'm just going to show you this little clip. This is actually from Ohio State. Welcome That's into a better tomorrow by making smarter choices today. One way is through the use of bio-based products and innovations. Stated simply, bio-based products are made from renewable plant-based materials. Common ingredients in bio-based products are soybeans, corn, grasses, and even food wastes. And whether these raw materials are made into a specific product, are used in packaging, or are converted into an alternative fuel, bio-based products are sustainable, making them a smart and practical choice for many different uses. Best of all, product performance is uncompromised. Bio-based products are often equal to or better than products made from non-renewable materials. Let's take a look at some common bio-based products <coughs> that are available to today's consumers. Adhesives, construction materials, fibers, paper, packaging, fuel additives, landscaping materials, paints and solvents are just a few examples on the market today. The United States Department of Agriculture, or USDA, has created an easy way to identify bio-based products. The USDA's bio-based label certifies that the product meets or exceeds USDA standards for bio-based content. Consumers need to look for this label on the products they buy to confirm they are made from bio-based raw material. Now that we understand what bio-based products are, let's explore why they matter to the economy, the environment, and everyday consumers like you. There are numerous benefits to using bio-based products. For starters, bio-based products utilize renewable raw materials. This reduces our reliance on non-renewable resources. Petroleum and fossil fuels 
have been used to make many of the household products that consumers have used in the past. However, the costs associated with using fossil fuels, including the environmental costs, have continued to increase, and those higher costs are ultimately passed on to consumers. A second benefit stems from the fact that bio-based raw materials can usually be grown, harvested, and processed closer to their point of consumption. Reduction in transportation costs, then, provides an economic advantage over the use of non-renewable resources. Non-renewable resources, on the other hand, are commonly extracted and shipped from hundreds or even thousands of miles away, which can add to the costs of the resulting products. Finally, bio-based products aid in job creation by creating new opportunities in the scientific discovery, production, and processing of locally produced materials. Each step in the process serves to stimulate the economy here in the United States. Although we recognize there are many reasons to purchase and use bio-based products, the most exciting part about the growth of these products is that we are just getting started. Every day, there are new choices and new opportunities to make a positive difference in the world around us by choosing to use renewable, plant-based resources in our daily lives. So join the growing number of consumers and consider purchasing and using bio-based products. Why? Because bio-based innovation truly is smart for tomorrow, but even smarter for today. Okay, so there's a quick snapshot of, uh, of bio-based products and things that uh, then go into this uh, system, into bioeconomies. So here's just some other metrics that the DOE tracks or has been tracking the last few years. There's now over 3,000 companies in the United States that are engaged in the bioeconomy. Over 5 uh, million gallons of cellulosic ethanol, and that's well below what the targets were for this stage with the renewable fuel standard, but that's about where we're at. One of the big areas where things are occurring and growing is in the airline industry that wants to use renewable fuels in their system, and, and so the USDA has this Farm to Fly program with nine different airlines involved in it, and there are, a number of those airlines are now taking biofuels and incorporating them on a regular basis as part of their fuels. Jobs and dollars, so these things are important when you talk to policymakers, so here's estimates of direct dollars in the bioeconomy and jobs in the bioeconomy, there's a whole other layer of sort of spin-off jobs and dollars that occur with that. And then starting with the sort of ideas and the innovation, there's a whole bunch of things. The DOE, these are DOE patents that they have worked with collaborators on, uh, patents and licenses that have come out of work that they've funded. So there's a fair amount of that going on as well. So where is this coming from, the supply piece? We've got to have plant material to turn into these products. So the US, uh, U.S. DOE has done this study, and they found that we can produce a billion tons more biomass in addition to what we're currently producing from farms and forests now by 2030. And there's some estimates of what that could be turned into, uh, 50 billion gallons of biofuels, 50 billion pounds of biochemicals, heating for 7 million homes in the United States. So it's a substantial amount and would have a substantial impact on the economy. This just gives you an idea of, of one model run. So there's lots of dynamics in these things. But this shows you where is that biomass going to come from. So here we have billion dry tons per year of biomass. This is what we're currently using now, the blue in the bottom. There's this waste stream, 130, 140 million tons of that material that's available now, right, that goes into waste streams now that we could be recovering and using more effectively for a wide variety of things. Then there's forestry. I will tell you from my perspective, this is a way underestimate of forestry potential, but they were very strict in how they uh, did this modeling. So 100 million or so tons of forestry uh, materials that could be added into the system. Ag residues, so there's lots of crops grown. We don't collect the residues from the main product. You can collect a certain portion of that and still maintain the quality of your soil, but we don't generally do that. So there's opportunities there. The big growth area, if we're going to reach these targets and build the economy, is energy crops. So dedicated crops that you plant for their plant material and their energy content. So we perennial energy crops, things like we work on willow here. There's herbaceous crops like switchgrass or miscanthus. This is an annual biomass sorghum crop. This is hybrid poplar. So there's a whole host of different ones. And where you are in the U.S., 
uh, would vary in terms of the type of crop that you would grow. But again, that's where the big growth is projected to occur. Currently not much occurring because of the cost structure of these things, but going forward, uh, it's anticipated that there'll be considerable growth if the bioeconomy is going to grow. This is a snapshot, again, from their modeling exercises to give you an idea of where this is going to come from, right? So the darker blue is higher concentration. Uh, even here in New York, we have potential from both forestry and agricultural resources to contribute uh, to make solid contributions to the bioeconomy. But it's going to be scattered uh, across the United States in different regions. So land use, where is the land going to come from? This is often one of these things that comes up as being an issue and a question. So again, just a snapshot quickly to show you what in this model run, what they're doing with land. So here is current pasture land, current uh, crop land, and then here's land, corn and soybean land that is currently being used uh, for feedstocks that are feeding into the bioeconomy. Okay, so it's just a fraction of the overall agricultural land. And going forward, uh, 2030 uh, or 2030 with some scale up. That's the numbers I just showed you to reach this billion ton target, right? So here's where the energy gonna, crops are going to come in. 25 to 30 million acres out of this 446 out of the pasture would go to energy crops. A little slice of 10 million or so out of all-purpose crop land and, and some and then other uh, out of the crop land usage areas that are being used now that will be turned into perennial energy crops. Mm -hmm. So overall, you can see, relative to the amount of agriculture and pasture land we have, the proportions are small. It's not huge, dramatic changes, uh, and it probably can be incorporated into the land base that we largely have there now. Okay, so I'm just going to stop there and wrap up. Again, these are the projections. If we get to this using this billion tons and run it through the bioeconomy, going to create lots of jobs, lots of power, fuel, products, um, and large reductions in the amount of CO2 uh, that come out of uh, the economy here in the United States. Okay, so I'll stop there. I'll make one last comment for graduate students. Uh, Oops talked about the cable program. There should be an email coming your way uh, about the opportunity for next year, so we'll be looking for a graduate student to take on the role that Oops had as a student delegate to this cable program. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tim, for the overview about the product that the, the balance is for the bioeconomy. Our next um, presentation will be made by Jesse Bond. Jesse is a professor at Syracuse University. Um, he has a Bachelor of Science from the University of Louisiana State University in 2002 and a PhD in Chemical Engineering at University of Wisconsin in 2009. Um, I will let Jesse to present himself and go with uh, his presentation. Thank you. So thanks, uh, Oops, for the uh, invitation. It's always nice to see your former students still open enough to invite you to events. <laughs> uh, so that's wonderful. I, I want to talk today, I come at things from the perspective of a catalytic chemist, uh, a biochemist, and so I just want to you know, give you my perspective of, of biomass and, and what we're doing with it. Uh, particularly, uh, we're shifting supply chains in industry right now, and hydrofracking has had a huge impact in the United States and globally uh, in how we're doing business in the petroleum refineries. Uh, so just to give you a quick snapshot of, of what where I come from as a scientist, uh, I, I see a lot of heterogeneous catalysis. So how do you make them, how do you characterize them, and how do you use them? Um, about 10 years ago, the applied focus in that field became sustainability. So how do we make petroleum product substitutes for petroleum products from more abundant or alternative resources? And so a lot of that came down to be things that you could make from sugar or lignin. And so I don't know how familiar everyone is with that topic, but uh, we'll take a quick look at it and talk about why it's so challenging. Um, so yeah, basically I'm talking about making things we use a lot of, uh, these industrial commodities, from alternative resources, so sugars and lignin, right? Um, and in general, the large market commodities that we think of would be things like, like gasoline, alkane fuels, uh, diesel, jet fuel, or maybe polymers and plastics, polyethylene, polypropylene, right? Uh, if you look at the chemical functionality of those molecules, uh, I show them on the right-hand side. You could think of those, you know, gasolines and diesels kind of like hexane, right? 
Um, and you can think of something like glucose as what you have a lot of in, in, in biomass. And you can see the difference is very drastic. There's a lot of oxygen content in that molecule. And so you have this big chemical challenge in getting to our normal commodity products. You're trying to pluck up all of those oxygens without breaking any carbon-carbon bonds. And it turns out that that's really hard to do, right? So what you end up with is if you want to try to make something like an alkane fuel from glucose, you have a lot of work to do in terms of chemistry and in terms of reactants you have to add. So the cost tends to be very high, right? Um, and when you're competing with cheap petroleum, it's very difficult to make carbon fuels. Uh, if you flip that around, you would think, let's say, you know, in a refinery, I have a ton of things that looks like hexane as a starting material. And if I were to think about making glucose from it, that would be a nightmare. An organic chemist could probably do it, but it would be ridiculously expensive. So the idea would be adding functional molecules for oxygen and more chemical functionality. In general, biomass is a better feedstock, more functionalized something would be. And you have a reduced product that you want to get. Hydrocarbons and crude oil tend to be the better feedstock. Right? So there's kind of this continuum. Things that you can make from biomass more cheaply, you might think about something like sorbitol, or alternative sweeteners. Those look a lot like glucose, right? It's just hydrogenated glucose. So that would be much cheaper to make from biomass. The problem is those things tend to have pretty small markets. They're valuable, but the markets aren't huge, and so it can be difficult based on those products to make a dent in oil consumption uh, because it's still mostly tied up in, in big fuels and big petrochemicals. Okay. So what I'd like to talk about today, and, and that challenge kind of gets compounded as the price of oil comes down, and I want to talk about places where you could find a competitive advantage in biomass and maybe uh, use that to bring things to market. And I'm going to give you two vignettes here. Um, does anyone know anything about maleic anhydride? Nobody? Oh, okay. Hello, Chris. <laughs> uh, yeah, former student. Great. Uh, so I'll... Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. I'll, I have the slide. So uh, we'll talk about maleic anhydride. It turns out to be a very important commodity. We make uh, you know, butane diol, tetrahydrofuran, uh, some polymers from this. So it gets used at very commodity scale, large commodity scale. But you see there's a lot of oxygen content and a lot of chemical function in that molecule. Uh, I'm going to show a little bit here. I, I don't know when I'm going to a general audience. My postdoc advisor one time gave a talk that looked a lot like this. And he had a lot of these lines and six structures, and there were no chemists in the audience. And at the end of the talk, somebody was like, well, I only have one question. What were all the lines? What did that mean? <laughs> so I always try to show, you know, when I, when I show these line representations, it's just carbons and hydrogens, just in case there are any non-chemists that are interested in bioeconomy. So that's what I'm talking about here. Anyway, let's talk about making maleic anhydride. This blows my mind that this works. You start from butane, okay? And you heat it up in oxygen at 400 degrees, okay? What do you think would happen if you were to just heat up butane at 400 degrees in air? I mean, this is your LPG tank attached to your barbecue pit, basically. What, what happens? It burns, right? Combustion, OK? So this is industrially the process. We basically take this, and it's not V205. It's a, it's a vanadyl phosphate catalyst. But at 400 degrees, butane, you just oxidize it. You don't break any carbon-carbon bonds. Uh, you just add three oxygens to the molecule and dehydrogenate it as well. This is crazy that it works. Um, and inevitably, some of that selectivity is going to be lost to combustion. You're going to make CO, you're going to make CO2, just like you guys said, you'll burn it, right? Um, and so the challenge there is what you're trying to do is just as I said, you're trying to add chemical function to an inert molecule, and that's hard to do, hence the high temperature. So one example in our lab, uh, you, many of you may be aware of levulinic acid. It's something you can make as a sugar dehydration product, and it turns out that you can take advantage, you know, where you see oxygen, that's chemical reactivity, things will tend to react at much lower temperatures than an inert alkene. So what you can do is activate this, and you can break that bond, and you can actually make maleic anhydride at a much lower temperature because the molecule is easier to activate. And in fact, you can drop it down uh, quite a bit, below 300 degrees, and you bring those single-pass yields well up above 70%. So it's one of those examples where a biomolecule, because of its inherent reactivity, can get you something that's hard to make from oil. Okay, so one example, one vignette from my world, and this is work that's sponsored right now from NSF. And I'll give you one more. I really love this one. This is fantastic to me. Uh, how much do you guys know about butadiene? Chris, thank you. So I, I, I get, it hurts a little when people aren't as excited about butadiene as I am, but, but really this is fascinating, right? Yeah, it's, it's so great, right? It's a huge, huge market. I mean, not quite on the size of fuels or polyethylene, but uh, all of our synthetic rubber. 
depends on butadiene supply, right? And I'm guessing that no one knows how we make this classically. No? Chris, thank you. <laughs> so Chris, I, I'm going to go to you for every, every point now. Uh, what we used to do, if you look in a refinery, you have these naphtha streams. And it's basically something that looks like this, a C7 straight chain. Uh, that's got a really terrible octane rating. You don't want to put it in gasoline. It's also a too short chain to go into diesel, and it's not a good jet fuel. So in terms of the big things we got out of a refinery, naphtha is kind of useless. All right? Again, small markets. So what do you do with it? Well, what do we always do? We just heat the hell out of it, get it really hot, and we start to break bonds and see if we can make something more interesting. Okay? And so this turned out to be a great thing. This was a good way to make ethylene. Right? Because ethylene goes into polyethylene, it goes into your chemical industry, and there's a ton of things that you can do with it. So ethylene is pretty awesome, whereas heptane, eh, not so much, unless you need a solvent. So this is classically how we made a lot of ethylene. And alongside of that, so I show you about 25% yield, what would happen is you really have a hard time controlling the cracking chemistry, so sometimes you would break it in the middle of the molecule. Well, great, that gives you something like propylene, which again, pretty good yield during a steam cracking process, I'll show here. So this is a way to make mixed alkene streams, which are all very useful. And occasionally, you would get something really cool to happen where you maybe break the bond and crack it twice, and if you just get so lucky, you make butadiene, okay? And it's about 3% or less yield. So what you had was in these steam crackers, you were running them, and butadiene was like this really trace product, and then we built a whole synthetic rubber industry around it, which blows my mind. This is fantastic, right? Now, this is one thing that hydrofracking has done is it's made natural gas really cheap. And what that means is ethane is, I don't want to say free, but it's really inexpensive right now. So instead of cracking naphtha, we've shifted to running all of our crackers on ethane, which is very abundant and inexpensive. It's very good for making ethylene, but it means that we don't do naphtha cracking anymore. And so guess what happens to the butadiene supply? It tanks, right? And when that happens, synthetic rubber becomes very expensive. So this is one of those problems, so to speak, that's been created by the shift to hydrofracking in our supply chain. Um, you don't have a good route to butadiene anymore. And so uh, we propose this, a virolactone, it's a levulinic acid derivative, so another thing you can make from sugars, uh, pretty easy. You can open the ring, you can decarbonylate it, and you can actually make butadiene, well, we propose by a biogenic pathway. And the NSF's currently supporting this work as well right now. Um, and I think that's everything I have. Those are just two vignettes from my world about opportunities where biomass might give you a competitive advantage if you can just get the catalytic chemistry uh, exactly right. So thank you all for listening and for inviting me, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Again, thank you, Jesse, for giving us this brief overview of what you have been doing in your lab and uh, how we could con convert uh, biomass into valuable products. Um, our next uh, speaker is um, Tom Abino. Uh, most of you are, um, know Tom. He has been here at ESF, and uh, I will give him the opportunity, and he will tell you more about him and his work. Okay, I wanted to start with this. Uh, this is the big picture in what I and Preston Gilbert call the New Forest Economy Initiative, a Northeast, because it's hardwood based, community based economic development initiative. And I'm going to flash past this fairly quickly. I could send this to anybody if they want it. It's a concept. We worked this out a long time ago working with uh, over with NYSERDA on you know, how do the pieces fit. There's a lot of the college in here. What I do is this piece right here. Here's willow, there's native fiber, there's also agricultural residuals. So this is input on this side. This in the middle I'm gonna talk about uh, today pretty much. But also, this is the part that I, I am retired now. I'm, uh, didn't I say faculty emeritus there, something like that? You know, that's a title they give you if it means you used to be faculty but you're not dead yet. Okay, so that's what I am, I think. I, I am here, okay. All right, so commercializing this, uh, turning it into something that will see the light of day in commerce is where I'm going. Going to the slides is, you can, I'm probably trainable. Okay. Forest bio uh, refineries from the past to the next 20 years. Okay. So the timer. Uh, that's me, uh, Professor Emeritus. But as you'll see, if I get time at the end, in fact, I wanted to turn this on because, as you know, 
I'm, I used to be a professor, so every time I start speaking, I think it's going to be 40 minutes long or 45. And you can stand up and say, Tom, all right? With a little luck, this will also bug me. All right. There's been a lot of attempts to commercialize bioprocessing, biorefinery, large scale, 100 million, 200 million projects, dollar projects that have failed. Uh, frequently, I think it's not exactly the fault of the people who put it together. They had an idea, probably a good idea, probably made sense in the test tube, and then they tried to go out and do it on a really large scale. And the problem is if you try to scale up too fast, in my opinion, is jumping off a cliff. I did this in industry, 23 years in international paper. I was able to scale up stuff without failing, uh, which led to a really good career. Uh, but I did it by refusing to jump further than engineering could stand uh, so that the equipment would still work. And then we had to learn how to go to the next scale. I'm going to go through quickly some of the caveats around this, not quite that quickly, about resources, uh, biomass, biorefinery. I'm going to talk a little bit of a worldview because it does matter. And my talk is going to connect with the speakers who have already spoken and the ones who will. But there isn't time to make all those connections. But you're the student. I hope you will. This is a rapidly evolving area that probably has got another 40 plus years of really good research and development in it because it's just beginning. The past, you know, where petroleum, coal, natural gas, and if you go back far enough, as Dr. Volk showed, it was wood. And the uh, chemical plants that used to exist in New York State were heavily destructive distillation, uh, which is a very crude way of taking wood apart, but it made made ethanol, acetic acid, and creosote, all of which were valuable products. They did not have many, not ethanol, methanol, acetic acid, and creosote, all of which were valuable products hard to come by. They also extracted trees to get tannins to tan leather, and make, to make leather, to tan hides and make leather. Uh, that, of course, all moved on in different ways. Today it's dominant for energy, but a significant portion, depending on just what source, from 1% to 6% of those actually end up in materials which is, in my opinion, very desirable because the materials tend to be far more profitable than the actual liquid fuels are. Now, biomass, there's food and residuals. Tim already showed the, the buildup of these. Don't need to go through all of that, I don't think. In the material side, the traditional stuff, I see wood. I see composite material here. Uh, a lot of that is going to go uh, valuable into the future, but probably be made more energy efficiently and probably be made with more valuable co-products coming out of the manufacturer instead of it being just a single product target. Uh, and solar and wind, I'm a, I'm a fan of both of them. It's not what I do, but they are growing uh, and becoming more cost competitive each year. The key resource attribute is this is if you're going to try to make some product out of a resource, it's got to be available in the quality you need. The technology to get it needs to exist, needs to be reliable reliably there, within reasonable proximity, you can't take resources too far, if there's a cost, physical resources, stable, if you're going to build a business, you can't go out of business for a couple of years, well, you grow some more wheat or whatever it's going to take, it's got to be there routinely, and it's got to be affordable. Uh, in an economic sense, it's got to be environmentally affordable, and society needs to agree that it's okay for you to do it. In a modern the world that I live in, all three of these attributes are critical. I'm pretty sure I picked the corner over there, Dr. Volk, from you sometime in the past. For U.S. wood to petroleum, a $100 a ton of wood was roughly equal to a $34 barrel of uh, oil. And what's oil today? 65 or so. All right. So the point is, uh, wood is very competitive, but I really don't like to just burn wood. I like to get a lot more value, like Jesse was showing. Those compounds are worth far more than the energy uh, content of them. My perspective is biomass and biorefin biorefining of biomass is where this is going to go. Now, there are so many types of approaches. I'm only going to talk about one, and I'm going to do it because it's mine. <laughs> and I'm proud of it. And it's the one I'm investing a great deal of my own time, my own personal money, in commercializing it because I'm convinced it has legs. We started researching it here heavily about 2002. Some of you were born, probably. No, kidding you a little, but okay. So we've been researching this for a long time. Since 2008, I thought it was ready uh, to become commercial, and I'm still pushing it. So that's why I formed a company in 2008 uh, to commercialize. It's an incremental deconstruction, taking wood apart carefully, 
in, uh, in a non-heavy-handed fashion, Jesse, to preserve as much of the complexity as we can so that when we do something with it, it's on purpose mm -hmm. to do exactly what we want to do. We use membrane technology for separations. Many of you don't know membrane technology, but compared to distillation, membranes used correctly are about two orders of magnitude lower in energy intensity than boiling things. Sometimes we still have to boil them, but you only do that when you have to. Uh, fermentation or thermochemical procedures, we do both. I like fermentation. It tends to be quite efficient energetically, but not always. And then product recovery is a lot like in many traditional chemical industries. You've got to get purity if you wish to get prices. All important. This is over in the pilot plant, over in Walters Hall. This is a 65 cubic foot digester, what you, which you probably wouldn't relate to all that much. But it means you put about a quarter of a metric ton of wood in there. So we're no longer test tubes. It's a quarter of a ton of wood. That's a pretty good sized pile. And then put, for, put a ton of water with a quarter ton of wood and do the extraction. Then after you clean it up, and there's a lot of separation stuff that, again, not to geek you out, but there's, there's stuff there that's kind of tricky. But if you're in those businesses, you go, oh, membranes. We know membranes. Oh, centrifuges. We know centrifuges. So there's a, putting it together the way I came out of the pulp and paper industry, which are very complex pieces of, of apparatus assemblies. This is, a, this is much simpler than a pulp mill. In this, this is a, over in the pilot plant in Walters Hall, a 400 liter fermenter. In this, we have made ethanol, PHA, lactic acid. We have not yet made butanol and xylitol, but I want to make butanol, and this would come back to some of the earlier talks. Uh, the Navy at China Lake Research Center has developed a process for getting from butanol to JP8. Do you know what JP8 is? Somebody here does. What is it? Jet fuel. jet fuel. It is the jet fuel. It is also what tanks run on when they're run by turbines, which is what most modern tanks are. JP8 is really critical for the world. And so I'd rather make butanol in part because you can make JP8, but also the energy recovery compared to the energy put in is better for butanol than for ethanol. So it actually energetically is a preferred way to go. Too long a story. Even if I was going to put it in my car, I would really prefer butanol to ethanol. It's more energy dense and it's not hygroscopic. It doesn't try to draw water into my gas tank. But that's again a little further down the road. It's not quite low hanging fruit yet. And therefore it's not what I'm doing. I want to talk a little bit about other nations in the world. Tim, Tim jumped me here and showed some of the perspective. Uh, because what happens, this is stuff that's really exciting. This talk that I'm giving you right here. First I did this talk, the pieces that I pulled this from in Helsinki at their request, Finland, uh, as, a, as a speaker at a bioeconomy conference. I've also Sweden, Germany, Spain, Portugal, as Tim showed, Argentina and Brazil, places that are really interested in this kind of stuff, and of course, uh, extensively in China. It says around the world, this is, this is something that pretty much everybody says, well, it's going to come. We're not sure when, but it is going to come, partly because it must come. Oh, no, halfway? No. All right. In the future, there will be a slow engagement in the pulp and paper industry. What I grew up in, these are very large facilities. They're very risk averse. But reconstituted wood products like pellets, like fiberboard, flake board, where when we do this hot water extraction, we make those products better than they are currently possible to make. And so that's where there will be an advantage, early advantage in the marketplace. And then the extract, we will segregate it into its components and sell them. More complex processes and higher value products will come but it'll be a while. These are the kind of the low-hanging fruit. I want to give you an example. If you want to commercialize something, you've got to be able to monetize at a pulp mill or at a cogeneration pellet plant, 700 ton a day, dry ton a day, wood coming in, capital investment 120, revenue 46.7, operating cost 21.6, discounted cash flow, return on equity is 19.3, or if you get an 80% loan, which USDA wants to give you, return on equity 38.7. In industry, those numbers are very, very, very good. The paper industry that I grew up in runs closer to 10% as far as average long-term return. But that doesn't mean the paper industry is going to do it, by the way. They're still too worried about what they're. But I think in the pellet case, that's probably where it'll go first. Here's why I wanted to make it this far. I see Dr. Boak here. I see Dr. Bianovic there. You know, there's, these are people, most of whom are at this school, but some are in China, some are other places around the world that have worked on this since I came here in 2000. This is not me. I mean, I'm trying to derive it and to commercialize it, 
but the number of people who have worked on it and who will be working on it is is huge, and I suspect it will grow more. Dr. Wells, there you are. Okay. We started working on this about 2002, maybe, or three, because biomass willow is a beautiful raw material for the process. Sugar maple is my favorite tree. It is also beautiful, and then we learned, gee, willow works just fine. You don't have to get the bark off to do what we do, and that's what that's, fits well with willow. Uh, my conclusions, in the midterm, I'm not sure why, requires more renewable energy, chemical, and materials. The world wishes them. It is, it is willing to pay not too much more, maybe not any more, and they have to be fully functional. But if they give a choice at the same price and the same quality, they will choose renewable. The biorefinery is a strategic need for energy, chemical, and materials. Biomass source attributes and market needs are really the key. This is partly why I'm going to commercialize in New York. We have high quality, sustainable forests that we know how to manage really well. And the higher value, more complex processes will come along. Integration with existing industries can speed the applications. Reconstituted wood products, pellets, fiberboard, flake board, maybe even strand board. Uh, mills, co-locating with them is where it's going first. Uh, the next step for me is the biorefinery uh, commercialization development center that the governor just put, uh, committed $6.6 .6 million to finish the funding of it. It's a $12.6 million project in Amman, New York, which is, and it's affiliated with uh, Alfred State University. That's the scale that's not a commercial facility. That's the scale we have to go to to be able to engineer a commercial facility. If we skip that step, and try to jump directly to a commercial facility, I predict failure. It's not what I want to do. It is not what I did in my industry career. Make your step, make your engineering steps rational. Don't jump further than you can see, and then you'll get there. Thank you to Dr. Amidon uh, for this. Uh really interesting presentation on his work on the hot water extraction process. Um, our next presentation will be made by Richard Patulski. Um, Patulski is the quality manager at Sunoco Agribusiness, and Rick served as quality and ma lab manager for Sunoco Ethanol in the 1886 Malt House in Fulton, New York. Rick has worked over 20 years in quality position for Housen Bosch, Northeast Biofuels, Sunoco Ethanol, and 1886 Malt House. We can a Bachelor of Science degree in food and si food science in from Cornell University, and an Advanced Certificate Program degree here at ESF. Um, let's welcome um, Rick for his presentation. Okay, thank you uh, very much for having me today. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here and speak to you about uh, what we do in Fulton. Um, three things I'd like to do today. I'd like to talk about uh, our core business, which is the ethanol business. Uh, we've started a new business, which is the 1886 Malt House. It's a, it's a, a part of the uh, bioeconomy. We're uh, malting grains for the craft brewing industry. And then the third thing is kind of talk about some of the things that we're hearing that are being done in research and in the laboratory and then are brought to us um, to put them into service, into place. And that was kind of how the malt house came about. Um, we have a plant manager that came to us about four or five years ago, and uh, he said that, uh, you know, we can only grind corn for so long. Corn is proven, it works really well in the, in the ethanol business, but we got to find other uh, ways of doing things. So, um, our core business, the ethanol business, uh, we're one of the largest, most advanced ethanol producers in the U.S., we like to claim that. Um, we're local here, as we talked about. Uh, we produce a renewable fuel which helps lower gasoline prices, lower greenhouse gas emissions, and reduces our na nation's dependency on foreign oil. That's kind of our uh, forte. Specifically, the plant, uh, right now we are uh, set this year to probably go over 80 million gallons for the first year. 
Um, one of the things we're most uh, proud of is we produced the E15 green uh, NASCAR blend. We're the official fuel of NASCAR. We have a race fuels plant uh, in Philadelphia. Each month we send a uh, rail car of about 25,000 gallons of denatured ethanol and then they uh, put it into the uh, final blend that NASCAR circuit runs. <coughs> In the ethanol process, we've got the critical byproducts that we also produce, carbon dioxide. Right next to our property is uh, Lindy Gas. They take our CO2 and purify it for medical and food use. Um, we produce uh, a byproduct, which is distillate grain, DDGs. I'm sure you may be familiar with that. That's a high protein, uh, high fiber uh, animal feed. Um, and then our last product is corn oil. Uh, which is uh, used for the uh, biodiesel market. It could be a food grade product if we wanted to go that route right now. Uh, the value is greater in the biodiesel market. So we're located about 30 miles up the road in Fulton, right below Lake Ontario. Uh, it was a former Miller Brewery, uh, more Miller Brewery plant that closed down. Uh, we are in the Riverview Business Park. Uh, you know we go up next to the Oswego River, Route 57, Route 481. All of that in the yellow is Sunoco property. Since we started in 2010, we've purchased more of that land. The Riverview Business Park is, is again, it's the old Miller facility. It's very large. There's a lot of real estate there uh, for these type of projects that, that are being talked about today. Talking about the ethanol conversion process specifically from corn. Each bushel of corn, which weighs about 56 pounds, can produce 2.7 gallons of ethanol. Uh, you get about a one-third ethanol, one-third CO2, one-third DDGs, and about 0 0.07 gallons of corn oil. Currently, the industry average is higher than the 2.7. It's about 2.87, and we've been fortunate to be getting our yield up to about 2.9, a little bit over 2.9, so we're, we're kind of uh, at the average or a little bit better. This is just some of the logistical numbers. Um, when you talk about some of the other projects, the biomass, it becomes, and I'll talk about this later, logistics is huge. Uh, we grind about 90,000 bushels of corn a day, okay? And in the back end, we're producing about 178 gallons a minute of denatured ethanol. That's over 250,000 gallons of ethanol. Every four days, we're making a million gallons of, of denatured fuel ethanol. And then you've got a third of that in DDGs, 700 tons a day, okay? So the numbers of trucks that are in and out of our facility, uh, we also have one of the largest rail spurs there on site, so a lot of movement by rail. This is a picture of our corn silos. We have two, each one can uh, hold about 500,000 bushels, a million total. That is about a 10-day supply for us. Just quickly going over the process, um, the corn comes in, it's not in the ear form, it is in the kernel form. It goes through a hammer mill, um, it gets mixed with a, a cook water, we make a slurry, enzyme is added, alpha, uh, alpha amylase is added. Without the alpha amylase, you, you need it to start the starch breakdown to the sugars for fermentation, and you also need it for the viscosity break. You've got about a 32% uh, mixture of solids, you would never be able to pump that. And this is the start of liquefaction. At our facility, liquefaction takes place, uh, residence about four, four and a half hours. It is at a, a temperature of about 185 degrees. That also helps in the cooking process. Uh, breaking viscosity, it becomes like your oatmeal that you cook on, on the stove. Um, and, and you wouldn't be able to pump it without that. Quickly going into fermentation, we add sulfuric acid. We bring the pH lower. Uh, we used to do this for enzyme, uh, optimal pH for the uh, working of the enzymes. We no longer do this. We found an enzyme that will work in a more, uh, a larger pH range. So we don't do it for that reason. We do it for, uh, to help protect the yeast. The bacteria that compete with the yeast um, do not compete well below 4.5, your lactic and acetic acid bacteria. Uh, at our plant, we use yeast propagation. And simply, uh, we have two tanks where we grow the yeast up only for the reason so that we don't have to buy as much yeast. There are plants that direct pitch, but you're purchasing it. Uh, we take the time to grow it and cut back on costs that way. 
So the next step is we add another enzyme, that's the glucoamylase, which uh, converts your starch uh, larger fragments down to the smaller glucose units, which the yeast can then consume and make uh, ethanol. Uh, urea is added as a nitrogen source um, for the yeast. These are our fermentation tanks from the outside. Um, these are the original Miller Brewer uh, Brewery beer fermentation tanks. We have 24. This is atypical of, a, of, a, of an ethanol plant. They're generally, you may have between four to six tanks, much larger in size. Uh, this poses some challenges for us. We have more pumps, we have more agitators, we have more gearboxes. So from a maintenance standpoint, uh, it's a lot more work, a lot more capital and, and required too. From a laboratory standpoint, we're now testing 24 vessels versus six vessels. So we have more HPLCs and uh, pH meters and, and the like. From fermentation, um, we finish with what we call beer. It's uh, the mash has now about 14% alcohol and a weight weight uh, uh, percentage. And from the beer, uh, it goes to a holding tank. We call it a beer well. Uh, really, this just gains some more fermentation time. So the fermentation is uh, continuing. And then we send it out to distillation. Uh, we have two columns. The first column, we call the beer column, brings it to uh, 100 uh, proof uh, ethanol, 50%. Okay, and then from there, it goes to a rectifier column, which brings it up to 190 uh, proof, which is 95% ethanol. And then the last 5% uh, moisture that needs to be removed, uh, we have a final product spec of 1% water, which can be in the ethanol. So to get it below that 1%, you have to have a molecular sieve. You can't do it by distillation anymore. Just scientific principle does not allow it to happen. So the 200 proof uh, ethanol goes to two day tanks. Each shift, Purdue fills one. They transfer it during the course of the day. Once a day on our night shift, uh, we have a final product transfer and we certify that tank. Um, two other inputs are added to the 200 proof uh, alcohol. We add a denaturant, which uh, currently we're using a natural gasoline, which is coming from, from the fracking. Uh, it's been a more favorable price. The sulfur content is lower. Uh, we have a sulfur uh, spec to meet as well. And then we add a corrosion inhibitor. Uh, that it's finished up, and by 4 in the morning, we're ready to start loading out trucks for, for the day, and trucks load out uh, pretty much all day. Here's a uh, picture of the uh, distillation columns. This is it at night. They're not gold. They're silver. It was just kind of a, a cool picture that was taken. And then the last part of the ethanol process is the liquid-solid uh, separation process. At the bottom of that beer column, your spent grains, we call that whole stillage, um, that is taken and it goes through a, a centrifuge process. The water from that uh, centrifuge is what we call thin stillage. And then you've got the solids, which we call the wet cake. That wet cake goes to the dryer. The thin stillage water <coughs> part um, goes to a series of evaporators and gets concentrated up to about 40% solids. It starts out about 4 to 5% solids. And then um, that syrup goes to a different set of centrifuges, a disc stack type centrifuge, and that's where the corn oil gets removed. So then we have a product what we call defatted syrup, and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit afterwards. And that gets put back onto the wet cake primarily. That product has some value for other uses that we'd like to look at, but right now it just gets uh, additional nutrients to put onto the feed to go to the dryers. Um, the thin stillage uh, back set there, uh, it's returned to the front end, along with the condensates, uh, all from the evaporators, goes to the kick, cook water portion that I showed earlier. So everything in our process is recycled. It's, it's, it's totally recycled. There's not a lot of waste in our, in our process. So then on to the dryers. Uh, we have two ring dryers. Uh, they make a very nice product. They are very uh, large. They go up about four or five floors. This is taken off picture off of a roof. So maintenance wise, they become pretty, uh, pretty intense when you have to work on them. You have to have a crane come in and work on motors and, and those types of things. Okay, the second part, um, the 1886 malt house. This is a new business for us. It's right next door. Um, we had 
purchased some property, additional space, and, and did the demolition work, and then worked on the uh, uh, selling this to our uh, corporate uh, uh, leadership, and they decided to go forward with it. And construction started uh, in the summer of uh, 2016. Last summer, it was ready for startup. And this fall, it's been fully operational. Um, the batch size is about 10 metric tons. All of the grains that we malt are from New York State supplied uh, growers. And our, our target audience is specifically New York State farm and craft breweries and distilleries. This is uh, just a quick overview of the malting process. It's uh, pretty much uh, a three-step process. There's a steep process, a germination process, and then a kilning. Um, this is not our, uh, our system, but we have a system very similar to this. This was made in Germany uh, by the Schultz company. It's all stainless steel. We have six of these uh, drums where the germination takes place and the kilning and we have two of these steep tanks. So potentially we can run, and steeping has taken a little bit less than two days, so we can run about six batches a week or the 60 ton uh, that I showed earlier. Um, uh, germination can take anywhere from four to five days. They're all different, uh, different recipes uh, that you can follow depending on what type of finished malt that you wanna make. Uh, right now, we've been working primarily with barley. Uh, that's the, the desired grain in, in beer making. Uh, we're going to bring in a couple loads of wheat next week. We have a local brewer that wants to do some wheat beer, and, and we're going to provide that for them. Um, and then in the kilning stage, that's the temperature. That's where you stop the enzyme, and you can uh, do different temperatures to get different colors uh, for, you know, for your finished beer product. Again, we source all of our grain from New York State. Uh, we have uh, supply contracts through October of 2019. We are always uh, actively seeking growers. Uh, we have worked with uh, two-row barley, six-row barley, uh, spring, spring barley, and uh, our winter barley as well. Some resources that have been you know, very important to get this business off the ground has been Cornell Cooperative Extension under the direction of Gary Bergstrom, plant science, plant science. All the breeding and the trials and the education is really being generated from Cornell and working with the growers. Uh, barley uh, <coughs> for malting back in New York State, this is kind of new. Uh, years ago, it was, it was a, a crop that was pretty stable. It hasn't been done in many years, so there's some challenges there. Hartwood College has a Center for Craft uh, Food and Beverage. Um, it's run by Aaron McLeod. Aaron used to work uh, for the Canadian Malting Commission uh, for a good many years. He's a subject matter expert. He's been an uh, outstanding resource for us. And we have the uh, privilege to have an in-house quality lab at our facility. It's, it's pretty much state-of-the-art. We are able to test all incoming grain, and we're all uh, able to do analysis on the finished product malt as well, so we can uh, actually run work samples and give the analysis to the brewers and let them know, uh, you know, what how it should perform for them in the brew house. Again, the challenges for the malt uh, industry are the varieties that are going to be developed in New York. Not only do you have the New York climate, but you've got the microclimates within the state. You've got the Finger Lakes regions, Albany, Buffalo. Uh, elevations, it, it, they're all different climates. Uh, storage is, is also a, a key consideration. A lot of growers have their cash crop, soybeans and corn, and then now they're going to do a specialty um, crop like barley. Uh, barley has to be a, a very high quality for, for malting. It has to be dried properly, it has to be stored properly, so there's a little bit more work involved there. So it creates a, a, a little gap in storage. Crop insurance uh, for the farmers and growers, it's in the works. It's not there yet. Uh, for someone to go and grow barley, it would be taking a risk at this point. And then the last point is the uh, secondary markets. What happens with the grain that doesn't meet grade that we can't accept? Um, in our first year, there were some um, grain that didn't meet the quality specs that we had, but you know, with our contracts, we honored them. We took them, and you know, the product uh, suffers. You can't do that for very so the secondary market now is really to go to animal feed, but it's kind of a specialty item. Animal feed is all 
kind of predicted. You've got rations. You've got nutritional plans already in place. So this is kind of like how do you fit it in? It's, it's certainly a good feed, high protein, high fiber as well. The future of the malt industry is going to be really the collaboration that's going to be uh, between the growers and the brewers and the maltsters. Uh, that's the, the key to keeping it sustainable. And then finally, I'd like to talk about some of the bioeconomy opportunities and uh, that we have worked at at, at our facility. Um, the first two topics are what we do. This is what we do that you don't see behind the scenes. Um, we're always looking at alternative feedstocks. Um, one of them was mentioned earlier. I think there was a picture, grain sorghum. Uh, Milo, it might be a little bit different than the picture was. This is grown out in the western uh, part of the country. It likes the hot, dry climates. It acts very similar to corn. Um, the kinetics and fermentation and all of that is very similar. Um, back in 2012, when corn was over eight, nine dollars a bushel, we had looked at uh, this uh, very closely, and we had logistically had it set up. We were going to bring a couple loads in and try it. Um, we did not because uh, some of the pathway um, issues that I'll talk to a, about in the next slide. Um, though it was approved as an ethanol pathway, it was not approved for corn oil. So those that produce corn oil, we couldn't use it. We would lose the RIN value there. Food waste is a big one. Uh, we've looked at uh, all areas of food waste. The biggest one that comes to mind is dairy whey. I know there's been work done here at Dairy Way uh, for many years. Dairy Way goes back to my college days. I don't think we've solved this problem. There's more and more produced with the yogurt that's uh, being produced uh, today. Um, this is something that, that could happen. Um, a lot of these things are things that we're working on, we've worked on. We do have some non-disclosure agreements with different uh, collaborating partners, so I can't talk about them as much as I would like to. There, there's a lot of information. What, I'm just trying to show that as an, interest, as an industry, we're always looking to do something uh, different as well. And wood waste, another one. Um, that's a big one. Uh, we were very close to doing a project with this. Um, what we were looking for was the C6 sugars. It was going to come into us in a very highly concentrated form, which would kind of be very similar uh, to the sugar stream that we already had. Um, that's where we were looking at for there. Other projects, uh, biodiesel plant. Um, in New York, there's no requirement for biodiesel. I believe there's a small, like a half a percent uh, requirement in Long Island for some heating oil. But in Pennsylvania, there's a two and a half percent requirement that bi uh, biodiesel must be included in the diesel supply. So that's where a lot of our corn oil goes uh, to, to satisfy that market. Uh, defatted corn syrup, um, talked about that before. Uh, that's the syrup that right now we're just putting on uh, the DDG. That is a, a, a very good product that could be used for higher value, specifically bioplastics is one. Um, there's people out there with technologies already. We've, we've worked with them. Uh, we've given them our product. Uh, we've made uh, little uh, plastic vinyl siding type uh, uh, pieces that could be used in the construction industry. There's, there's many, many uses that could happen here. Um, CO2, we produce a lot of CO2. Lindy takes just about all of it, but they're, uh, you know, they have production limits as well. They can't take it all the time. Some of it goes to our RTO and gets burned off. So we looked at a dry ice plant. Um, We've been over to Europe and England. We visited with a company that takes CO2 and does higher value products as well. Um, so just uh, the reason for those are just to show you that we're, we're always working on these types of things and, and looking to do uh, something new and uh, innovative and, and, and value for the company. And then lastly, the common challenges for, you, for all of this, uh, logistics. Uh, if you take like dairy whey, you know, the, the concentration of sugar is so low, you'd be transporting water if you're going to bring it to us. You know, how do you work that out? Same thing with the, uh, the sugar streams. It has to be very highly concentrated. I have uh, on here the feedstock value proposition. 
price in the sugar content. Sugar content being the concentration needs to kind of match where we're already at or else we're going to lose production gallons, right? Um, the value of the <coughs> feedstock. You put something out on your curb that doesn't have any value to you, um, and I come over there and I pick it up every day, pretty soon you're going to say to me, you know, hey, what are you doing with it? There's a value there, right? So we're taking a waste off someone else's hand, but eventually that waste is a value to us, and then you have to work out the uh, uh, contractual agreements on, on, the, on the free uh, um, feedstock. Uh, Dr. Amadon talked about scale up. This is so important. Um, we've done some flask work. It's, it, it works in the flask. You need to get to the pilot scale, the much larger scale, and you've got to demonstrate it, that it's going to work there and to eventually get to the production size tanks. Um, that is, is, is key to get your capital investment. Then once you show that it can work, then you're going to have to show the return on that investment. And whose money are we talking about? Are you talking about your company's money? Are you talking about independent investors? Uh, are you talking about the state's money? So uh, that's very important. And then the last two uh, ch challenges or hurdles or just considerations are the, are the pa I'll call regulatory, their pathway. Uh, you've got the EPA and you've got the RINs. There's some work that needs to be done there whenever you're putting new inputs into the system. Uh, we are now an animal food producing facility. Before we were like an ethanol facility that had a uh, byproduct that we sold as animal feed. But with the Food Safety Modernization Act that came about a couple years, ethanol plants were included. We're a food safety, uh, a food processing facility. So any new input, like a new yeast, a new enzyme, uh, a new feedstock, would have to have uh, either a GRAS or an AFCO uh, approval, and you'd have to demonstrate that. So all this, uh, the point of this is, is it can take time. I think that's uh, pretty much it. Questions, we, we'll get to later, right? So, thank you. Thank you very much, Rick, for this nice uh, presentation. Our last speaker, and not the least, is um, Dr. Jacqueline Ebner. Um, Dr. Ebner has is her PhD in 2015 in sustainability from Rochester Institute of Technology, where her research focused on valorization of food waste in New York State, including a focus on bioethanol, anaerobic digestion technologies, and life cycle assessment of environmental impacts. Since graduating, ja Jackie has held faculty position in the Golizano Institute for Sustainability and the Sounders School of Business at RIT. Um, she is currently a visiting professor in the Department of Public Policy in RIT's College of Liberal Arts. And she is well known for her last work in the report in the bioproducts in the Finger Lakes area. Um, welcome, Dr. Jackie. Give me a quick question. Did I just click the right mouse there? No, no, no. Okay. Into advanced, sorry. Okay. There's a keyboard. Let me just see. Uh, do I have to spring or? Can this one? So, since we're kind of running out of uh, low on time, I'll just go ahead and start. Um, it's kind of interesting that my, top, my uh, talk is titled uh, Overview and Trends, because it's really going to be a wrap-up. So I'm, I'm going to touch on a lot of the, it kind of pulls together a lot of the things that the other presenters have already talked about. Um, as Upstate mentioned, just scroll it. Okay, I'll give it a try. Um, I work in the field of sustainability, which a lot of people could ask, well, what is that? But basically, I look at big system problems. So I'm looking at the bioeconomy and how to promote the, this progress that we've talked about today, going from a wood-based economy now to a fossil-based economy and now to what's next, back to a, a bio-based economy. And how do we drive that? So I look at the social you know, aspects, the policies, the technology, economics and the business uh, influences as well as um, 
environmental impacts and try and, and look at it from a system perspective. And that's what I'll, I'll be taking you through. So we've already gone through what the bioeconomy is. <clears throat> what I want to point out here is that it touches on a lot of important problems of our time. So we're looking at utilization of natural resources, the fact that we have limited natural resources, climate change, food security, economic and social development, energy security, public health, a lot of big problems of our time. Let's see. Uh, so it encompasses a lot of different industries. You could consider uh, conventional bioeconomies, uh, industries such as, you know, paper and pulp industry, uh, food production, nutrition industries. Those might consider, uh, you know, uh, traditional bioeconomy sectors. And now we're looking to transition some of the things that were displaced by uh, fossil fuels back into uh, bio products. So we're looking at using microbes or industrial en enzymes as transformation agents for pro or for process changes and making bio-based products including, um, you know, the enzymes and obviously the biotechnology, but looking at making um, chemical, uh, chemical material products, nutritional <coughs> supplements, um, energy products, as well as uh, other products. Um, so here it says agricultural feedstocks. I also want to mention that, as we, we heard earlier, industrial municipal waste streams are also a really important part of the bioeconomy, and that actually is, is sort of my area of focus. Um, I'm not going to go through this, especially since the animation isn't on, but there are a whole bunch of different players looking at it from uh, you know, European Union or, or uh, continent level sort of uh, strategies. We've got a bunch of different national level strategies. We've got companies that are interested. We've got cities and municipalities. And this report that Upstate mentioned, which I have a few copies of, is really uh, looking at the Finger Lakes region and how we can promote a regional st strategy uh, similar to what we see in some other states to try and uh, capitalize on the assets we have here for the bioeconomy. We already talked about sort of the potential of the bioeconomy. Um, real quickly, in terms of the policies around the bioeconomy, um, this roadmap, this um, uh, billion ton report really came out of um, the first sort of comprehensive strategy in the United States to look at the bioeconomy under the Obama administration, the bioeconomy roadmap. And out of that, there was an effort to try and quantify what, is our, what are the biomass resources that we could sustainably harvest, and then what would be the impacts? You know, how many jobs? What's the size of the uh, uh, displacement of different products that we could have? Um, you know, how many jobs can we create? So this effort then uh, drove some policies in terms of primarily research and development and rural projects through the uh, Farm Bill's energy title. Um, it's been in there since 2002. Uh, we're redoing the Farm Bill now, uh, but we have, you know, some of the research actually that was mentioned here from this school is, is related to uh, some of the programs here, like the, the Biomass Crop Assistance Program, um, Bio-Based Manufacturing Assistance Program, things like that. Um, we also heard a little bit about the USDA Bio Preferred pro uh, Project, so this is a a database of certified bio-based products and some government policy, uh, procurement policies for government organizations as well as those that are interested in uh, for different, it can, you know, satisfy some components of um, lead certification or some other certifications to use bio-based products. That's a typo there. I guess there's about 2,000 plus products in the database and 100 different product categories. But really the main um, policies in the United States at a federal level have been looking at fuels and biofuels. And probably the most familiar to you would be the renewable fuel standards. These are mandates uh, for a certain portion of our fuel to be, our transportation fuel primarily to be from um, biofuels. And there are a bunch of different categories for the different types of, of biofuels. So we have um, what are typically called first-generation biofuels or starch-based biofuels, the corn ethanol, um, that um, we, we, falls under the category that's actually sort of a calculation from the mandate of uh, a conventional target. So there was an overall target of 36 billion 
uh, gallons of, of fuel that we wanted to have from biofuels, and we were ramping up uh, slowly every year. So 16, uh, 15 billion gallons uh, a year are supposed to be starch-based ethanol. Now that's capped. And there's also an issue with the, uh, the blend wall of 10% uh, ethanol being fairly ubiquitous now in terms of 10% ethanol being matched uh, in terms of the, the ethanol blend that's, that's common in your, in your pumps. So most of the growth that we're going to see there, they're really looking for to be in either uh, advanced biofuels, uh, these second generation biofuels, so cellulosic biofuel or advanced biofuels where, where uh, bio-based uh, biodiesel also falls into that category. Um, we see a whole bunch of other state or cross-cutting policies that sort of intersect and play a role in the development of the bioeconomy. At New York State, we're in the middle of uh, reimagining, uh, renewing the, the energy vision, reimagining our electricity grid, and looking at targets for renewable energy uh, and energy efficiency and greenhouse gas reduction at the state level. So we have a target of, I can't read my notes here on this uh, uh, viewpoint here, but I think it's 40% uh, by, 40% renewables by 2030. Um, and we also have, you know, other initiatives like New York State Climate Smart Cities. Um, we have an impending uh, food waste um, ban so that food waste can no longer go to the landfills. We already have a ban in place, a commercial food waste ban in New York City, and several surrounding northeastern states have had it for years, Vermont, Connecticut, um, um, some other uh, Massachusetts states like that, as well as on the West Coast, um, San Francisco and some other cities. And now we're looking pretty soon that there will be a, a New York State ban, again, starting with commercial facilities and then um, you know, increasing to, to affect uh, lower and lower generators in terms of uh, limiting the disposal of food waste uh, from going to the landfill. So that frees up a big resource, a big biomass resource. Uh, we have the greenhouse gas um, uh, exchange, the REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. So this is a cap and trade program uh, that allows for the trading of, of um, <coughs> greenhouse gas, uh, you know, uh, credits. So that also plays into the viability of uh, biofuels in the bioeconomy. Um, California, actually Oregon and British Columbia all participate in the low carbon fuel standard that believe it or not, actually is also a factor here in terms of driving um, the bioeconomy. And, you know, it fits in at a, at a global scale to, you know, Paris Accord, the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, um, which many companies are looking at and uh, is also a driver in terms of uh, policy. So I wanted to just talk about um, a few significant trends that we see in the bioeconomy that we've already touched on from the other presenters. So the first important thing to remember when we're trying to make a big shift like this to a new uh, type of, of way of doing things, bioeconomy, is that we're displacing fossil-based products with renewable bio-based products, and it's a big <coughs> shift. So um, it requires it's really not a sector per se, but it's really a cluster of interlinked value chains. And we kind of heard a little bit of that when we hear Sunoco saying that, yeah, now we're you know, looking at a chemi the chemical market, the fuel market, the animal feed market, you know, maybe uh, other markets. So we're playing in a bunch of other sectors by being part of uh, this interlinked value chain. And all those connections have to be established, and it takes time to build that. Um, so we have to make new members, new connections, new processes. And you could even add, you know, this the commercialization step, right? So a lot of these, you know, the infrastructure required to take things from technology to commercialization don't exist for the bioeconomy. We need to build that infrastructure. Um, also, we're competing with an industry <laughs> that is very evolved for the last century and has significant economic and political power. So... Um, not only are we seeing a lot of turbulent policies, so like for example, the renewable 
uh, fuel standard that I talked about was recently under pressure by the Trump administration, threatening to, to repeal it. Some pressure from the rural community and the farmers have kind of made them sort of retract that for now and pull back on it. But there's been uh, turbulence in terms of a steady direction, a steady policy, even though we did have this roadmap in 2012. Obviously, the fracking boom has driven a lot of shift back to natural gas-based uh, products from where we started to see a transition. And we've seen some volatility in terms of feedstock prices as well. So, you know, we're looking at setting up uh, an integrated network um, where we have, you know, uh, logistics, uh, harvesting, collection, biorefining. Then we have all of the outputs, the biofuels, biochemicals. A lot of these require large partnerships with multinational chemical companies, with find distribution channels to make into other products. Many chemical products go through a chain of, of progression to be uh, in their final form in a, in a consumer product. Um, so we're looking at trying to set up this ecosystem of a bioeconomy. Um, we keep talking about this term biorefinery. Uh, maybe it's worth taking a moment to just kind of talk about what it is. So analogous to a chemical refinery where, you know, in a typical barrel of oil, we'll see, uh, you know, 19 gallons of gasoline, 11 gallons of diesel, 4 gallons of jet fuel, 4 gallons of other products, maybe asphalt, other things like that, 7 of chemicals. Um, everything that comes in is trying to be efficiently turned into a product when it goes out. And interestingly, when we look at fuels, so we've got 76% of the volume is worth $935 billion, but 16% at the top end is worth $812 billion. So we've got uh, some co-products, if you will, or products that we make in a very small quantity that benefit from the economies of scale of having the infrastructure to make um, you know, the process of making all these fuels enables the efficient making of, of these specialty or smaller uh, quantity chemicals, but they're a higher value and they're bringing in uh, just, just as an important revenue stream to the overall viability of the refinery. So we're looking at sort of an, an analogous um, development in biorefineries where we have to have a variety of different products and we're looking really at high value products to complement fuels or commodity products as well. Uh-oh. So let's see what we can whip through here. So not only are we seeing a biorefinery that has multiple co-products and multiple revenue streams and operates in multiple markets, um, so that's one component. And, and not only are we seeing economies of scale, um, diversity in terms of volatility in, in, the, in the market prices for supply or demand, of the product, uh, but also, you know, distribution of the greenhouse gas impact. So it makes it more sustainable the more products that we can make. So we, we saw with Sunoco this example, right, where we have of the uh, corn coming in, about a third is protein and fiber, goes into DDGS, uh, animal feed product, very significant today. It's, a, it's the second largest animal feed ingredient. It's re this placed, uh, uh, Soy, uh, soy component that was the second largest in animal feed production. We've got CO2, which can be captured and marketized, which it sounds like they do. And then we've got distillers uh, corn oil um, that also can be made into biodiesel or made into a food grade product. So we're seeing in the, uh, the conventional, the first generation ethanol plants, this idea of a biorefinery. We see it also for biogas production, where siting a biogas plant, is it's very important to look at how you can utilize the waste heat. You've got a combustion process. If you're making electricity, how can you use that waste heat on site for a process or for some sort of district heating? Recovering the fiber for either uh, bedding products or other types of uses. We also have some companies we're working with that are trying to, to make a high value lignin product. Um, organic fertilizers that return the nutrients back to the land displacing uh, fossil-based fertilizers, 
and some sort of a fuel. Actually, electricity, we're starting to see it shift now because electricity generation in the state had such unfavorable terms for biogas-based electricity, and it's getting RINs for or the tradable component for the renewable fuel standard. They're eligible for the type of RINs um, that qualify it as a cellulosic uh, fuel. So uh, a lot of biogas production is shifting to um, uh, fuels where we're seeing uh, liquid natural gas or compressed natural gas sort of um, uh, fuel applications. And then we're also seeing a lot of uh, trying to get more biochemicals in and or advanced fuels. So um, in 2004, the DOE and NREL uh, came out with a report of the 12 value-added chemicals that can be made from biomass. They've updated that with some new chemicals. And these are all building blocks that can be made from bio-based products that can be made into uh, other higher value uh, chemicals. So we're starting to see uh, processes for that, which leads me to the next trend, which is different types of biorefinery models. So we've also heard that it's really hard to transport biomass, right? It's heavy, there's a lot of water in it quite often. So we're seeing the evolution of different types of models to, to make a biorefinery. So in some cases where you've got, like, you know, Iowa, and where you've got lots of corn and you've got big infrastructure to take big train loads full of corn into your um, ethanol refinery, uh, they've got an efficient way to, to gather that corn and, and to uh, have a centralized facility, and they're just looking at getting the most out of it that they can, right? Make as many different products in, in a centralized facility. But we're also seeing with, with other biomass or even diverse types of biomass that can be made into either industrial alcohols or the C5, <coughs> C6 sugars, um, that they can be made out of a variety of different biomass in different locations where that biomass exists. So we may see, you know, woody biomass make, make, making uh, uh, industrial alcohol and making a, a C5 or C6 sugar proce uh, product, and we may see it coming from a municipal waste process, and both of those, if they meet quality standards, can then go from like a hub um, spoke sort of uh, formation into a centralized facility that can then make, make it into uh, a, a final bioproduct. Um, and we're seeing bolt-on technologies that can, that can be added on to existing plants to add new processes. It's, I think we heard a little bit about that. Um, okay. So, I guess wrapping up, we, we have a lot of different definitions on what is included in the bioeconomy and a lot of different projections on the growth of the bioeconomy, but it's safe to say that there is significant growth projected uh, in terms of this new market. Um, and recent survey on in 2018 said the 72% of bio ex executives are more optimistic about their organization's prospect for growth, 68% um, more optimistic about the whole industry, 67% uh, were working on a project to add capacity. Um, mostly in fuels, but also chemicals and biomaterials. Um, when asked about the biofuel, expected to reach 1 billion gallons global capacity by 2020 or 2021. We're seeing renewable diesel as a really large potential. Aviation biofuels also a very large uh, potential for growth. Obviously, everyone's sort of hoping and waiting for cellulosic ethanol to take off and, and renewable gasoline. So those are the main uh, products. And the main feedstocks that they plan to employ, woody biomass, forest residues, municipal solid waste, uh, different agricultural wastes, and residues uh, as well. And wrapping it up a little bit of in, in a hurried way, but trying to leave some room for questions. Uh, the bioeconomy is definitely coming. Uh, the sector is seeing gr growth greater than the economy as a whole, even despite low oil prices and other pressures uh, in terms of, of, of the environment. Uh, it's fueled by exciting developments in biotechnology. Um, there's a lot of local interest, which I didn't go into here, and, and entrepreneurial efforts, but we obviously you know, heard about 
uh, quite a few here on the board with the research that's being done and, and the local uh, efforts at Sunogo. And New York State and the Finger Lakes region is well positioned with a lot of um, biomass assets, a lot of uh, human capital assets, um, a lot of technology, um, and a lot of entrepreneurial interest um, to contribute in a significant way. And, and for those of you, again, that are interested in the report, um, I brought a couple copies. So with that, we'll move on to questions, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. And now it's time for questions. First, before we go to the series of questions, um, I think you have received like uh, a questionnaire when you get in. Please, if you can turn that uh, back to um, before you leave, that would be great. So now it's open. Um, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. And We'll start in the back. I have a question about aviation biofuels. Just to anyone who can answer. Um, how would you deal with issues of gelling at like the higher altitudes? I feel like there's a higher um, risk associated with failure would be way higher for that than some of the higher trucks. Can you speak up a little bit? Sorry, uh, with regards to aviation biofuels, I'm just wondering how you would deal with issues related to gelling. Okay. So I think what you're asking about is, is when you get to higher altitude, the temperatures drop and you're afraid that the fuels will gel, right? So uh, that's what, what Professor Amidon brought up about making bio jet fuel from butanol. The way you do it is, you know, if you have a linear alkane like diesel, they tend to gel at very low temperatures. I'm sorry, very high temperatures, relatively speaking. And what you do is you introduce branching. So if you have a branched hydrocarbon, it will gel at a much lower temperature. And so your jet fuels need to include a lot of branched hydrocarbons like you have in gasoline. And so that's why butanol is a feedstock. But you, what you do is you oligomerize it, and it makes a lot of branched hydrocarbons. So that's pretty good for a jet fuel. Lousy for a diesel, uh, but, but in a jet fuel, you want it to keep the, the melting point down very, very low. And biodiesel would be a big problem. It's not the right one. <laughs> That's not going to show up in jet fuel. No. Yeah, so this is kind of for Richard. Um, so you were saying that for every bushel of corn that you guys push through, a third of it goes to CO2, some distillers grain, some ethanol. But you also mentioned uh, some corn oil. And I fry a lot of chicken, and I use corn oil. So is that corn oil that comes out, is that food safe, or does it have to be processed to be food safe? Like, what do you normally do with it other than ship it to Pennsylvania to use for biodiesels? The, the corn oil that we produce, yeah. it's, 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 we, we send it to biodiesel. Uh, it can be food grade, but for animal feed. Okay. Okay, it wouldn't be for human consumption. <coughs> it's not the corn oil that you would buy at the store. But the, the uh, grease that you work with, that you work with frying your chicken, as that gets used, the restaurants, that could be a feedstock for a biodiesel plant to, to make uh, <clears throat> biodiesel. Also for you, uh, dry distilled grain you are using for animal feed. Is there any other use you are considering? You could pelletize it and you could use it for fuel, uh, burn wood stoves. That, uh, there was a market higher value for that. Um, <coughs> honestly, I believe it could use, be used for human consumption. Um, you might have to do a few different things to it. Um, the way it's you know processed now, but, but there are some. Uh, research places that bake with it, make brownies and those types of things, and they promoted it, but it's never seemed to really have caught on. Have you seen the conversion to some higher value projects from TDD? There's, uh, I mean, you could treat it, it treat it as like cellulosic type feedstock and do further conversion there. Those are some of the bolt-on uh, technologies that uh, was talked about as well, um, not necessarily at the DDG st standpoint because you put all that energy in the process to get it at that point. You would go back uh, earlier with, at the whole stillage stage and, and, and work on the cellulose there. Uh, 
digest there's four times as much water as wood when you get to use it though almost all of that is internally recycled so it's going to go around many times so but it but it's four to one four times as much water as wood it takes that much water to cover the wood yep. uh, I'll start our uh, you mentioned that we have lots of old retired facilities um, and we have seen with the old brewing plant that we were able to upcycle it into uh, an ethanol refinery, is it possible that any of the old paper refineries could also be, or paper making facilities, uh, be upgraded to other more modern uses? I, I believe that a number of them eventually will. It's just that they're all way too big. We can't get to that scale yet. After we do the scale I talked about, 700 ton a day, and prove it there, then uh, some of those other big mills sort of go out of business. A lot of their equipment is reusable. And that would be a pretty big cost savings, and and for society, good not waste all the effort that went into building that stuff. It happened, but that's a little further down the road. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, do oils have any particular impact on uh, what you're trying to form in the lab, chemistry-wise? Oils. What do you mean? Um, I don't know if there's like a certain family. I mean, not family, but a chemical makeup for oils or something along those lines. So you use um, something that's uh, a seed or something that has a lot of oil okay. on the outside or something like that. So like a biological, you know, corn oil or vegetable oil okay. or, or whatever. Uh, so yeah, oils have some interesting chemistry. Uh, you know, inherently it's a glycerol with three carboxylic acids attached to it. And so any of the chemistry you could do with glycerol, which is a, a C3 with, it's a trial, three alcohols on it. So that has some interesting chemistry that you can do with. You can imagine it being a feedstock for, uh, I don't know, propane diol or acetylene. Or, there's a lot of interest in using that part of the oil. And then on the carboxylic acid side, there's a lot of wonderful chemistry that you can do with carboxylic acids. And then the other thing, uh, you know, different unsaturations. You hear about like saturated versus unsaturated fats. Basically, that has to do with the amount of CC double bonds that are in the, the carbon chain. And so for every CC double bond, you can do some interesting chemistry there. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess oils in chart have a, a diverse bit of chemistry around them, and you can use them for some interesting things. There are some specialty oils that hit, I think, in one like the Stokesia labels that has, it makes a drying oil. It, it's the way it's built. Yeah. And so you can do some special things, yeah. but those are very targeted. Each oil, you just make sure it's the one you need for what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. So I have one question for myself. Uh, um, Jackie. What are s some of the implications, like in terms of policy, of uh, if when we decide to move forward with the bioeconomy system? Well, I think uh, a lot of what I talked about on the local level kind of needs to happen. So either at a state or a local level, a lot of this infrastructure and investment in the uh, scale-up technology uh, investment. Um, uh, Connecting the, the, the technology with larger uh, multinationals or larger companies to help with, with commercialization and end products. Um, you know, the kind of stuff that, that I guess that they're doing here in terms of understanding the, the biomass market, um, the, the size of the, of the biomass resources in the region. Uh, I'm not really kind of, I think uh, in Europe and in other places there we've seen sort of a greater national focus I, I don't really see that same focus happening in the United States right now but um, certainly that would you know, at the I would just consistency is key right yeah. I mean one of the big challenges with policy if you change it every four years you know Tom's been working at trying to get out of the lab to pilot scale for years and years right and so I, you know, and Richard, at your scale, if they start changing policy every four years, I mean, that makes it very difficult. You just, you mentioned a few things, you know, the Food yeah. Safety Act that's come through that you guys now need to regulate. But if you keep changing policy, it's really hard to build business operations, right? I, I, I hear that over and over again when I go to workshops mm -hmm. and conferences, <coughs> companies that feed back that information. The, the capital investments are huge, and if we put at risk, by a simple policy change, how do you justify putting 40 million or 100 million into a process? So it is stability and the belief that it will be stable. And 
necessary prerequisite of big capital investment, and it's a struggle when it's policy. As you um, grow demand in the art state for uh, these bioproducts, how do you uh, protect suppliers in New York from uh, Midwestern producers who might be able to uh, supply um, kind of your biofeeds? I can take one, Tim. Well, I was going to say, Richard, maybe you could just comment on okay. where you guys get your corn supply from. I mean, you're, you're used a lot. Yeah, we do. Uh, initially, we um, source a lot of our corn from New York State. Um, and recently, I would say it's probably more 50-50, and, and, and a lot of it really comes on the economics of it, okay? Um, you know, it's 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 produced in greater quantities. In the Midwest, the, the corn price is cheaper, but then you have to pay for the transportation to get here. And we get the local growers, the local marketers. They know the prices and they know what we pay for transportation, and they price it. And it, I would say, it's in the growers' hands personally, you know, and doing business. In my <laughs> way of working where I'm heavily wood based, uh, it just won't happen. You can't afford to ship more wood more than about 100 miles. It isn't valuable enough to ship much further. Corn is, but wood is. So uh, the trees have to be pretty close. And New York is a very heavily forested state. If anyone who drives around or flies over it, it's a heavily forested state. And we've lost quite a few of our wood using facilities. Uh, and yet the people who own forests still have to pay their taxes and need some products. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would just add, you know, in talking with the, the ethanol plant, I mean, he says he pretty much does everything locally, but buys elsewhere. So I, I think that the, the, the shipping is a big factor. Where you're really going to see that break down a bit is when you start to have these intermediate products and you can really concentrate it. So... Like you were saying about whey, when you get to whey permeate or you get even more concentrated, you know, feed stocks or these, you know, different types of, you know, building block chemicals, and you can start to, to trade them a little bit more. But otherwise, that's probably one of the biggest advantages, I think, of the bioeconomy is that it's inherently local. On the corn side, and being a New York State person, an awful lot of our corn is grown to feed our cows. New York is a pretty big dairy state. And if they feed it to the cows, it's not available to you. So you need to purchase it where it's available. Yeah. I think we are close to the end. Um, we'll give our speaker a chance to add any last word if they have any including remarks. I want to add a last word for Richard at Sunoco. You have a new name for the facility, right? What's it called now? The Sunoco Agribusiness. Sunoco Agribusiness. To me, this represents a traditional mainline oil company saying, oh, the future is going to be different. And that, to me, is in its own light a really positive sign, Richard. Okay, very good. If you have any of the assignments uh, for folks in my class, uh, make sure you get them to the chin, please. Thank you very much. So I was curious about this.